Revelation chapter 6, and in this class, verse 9, 10, and 11. We're going to devote a whole session to seal number 5, the fifth of seven seals, seven judgments God's going to send to this earth during the tribulation. Verse 9. By the way, I hope you'll always have your Bible handy or be where you can refer to it with ease as we study together. And when he had opened the fifth seal, that's our Lord. I'll take an amen here. He alone is worthy to open the seven seal book. We've discussed that book earlier. When he had opened the fifth seal, I saw, now listen to this, it's strange, under the altar, the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Here are Christians who have been slain. Let me give you a synonym, murdered. Now let me give you the religious word, martyred by the Antichrist and his crowd because they love Jesus. The first seal is the Antichrist himself, I believe, and I explained why. The second seal, peace, is taken from the earth. That's got to be war. The third seal is blood, blood shed. The fourth seal is going to be scarcity of food, famine, if you will. And now the fifth seal. War is declared upon the saved who are upon this earth during the tribulation. They're going to be, and when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar, this is not an earthly altar. Mark it down. This is the altar in heaven. That proves that in heaven right now, there is a tabernacle, I think probably the better word, there is a temple. When Moses constructed the earthly tabernacle back in Exodus chapters 25 through 40, God said, Moses, you're building this one as a replica of the one in heaven. These souls are under the altar. Who are they, Lord? Souls that have been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they have. We've got to stop a minute. When the rapture occurs, the rapture of the church, Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, I believe. We have studied it together. All the saved, all the born again of earth are caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Now, I don't know how many months previously, or maybe now years previously, the rapture was. We're in the tribulation period. But it's been enough time. There are people who have been saved. People who have been born again by the grace of God. Preacher, I'd like to know how they got saved. There is no telling how many Bibles have been hidden around this world. And some not hidden in drawers, on preacher's desk, in Sunday school teacher's uh, bed stands. And uh, these Bibles are going to be found. And you can mark something down. The world overall generally is going to be rejecting and rebelling against the Lord. But uh, there's going to be some. There will be some who will say, wait a minute. That rapture? I heard about that. Uh, there are going to be some who will say, these terrible judgments coming, no doubt, from God. I, I've read about it. They're going to pick up a Bible. They're going to read a Bible. And you mark her down. They're going to get saved by the grace of an almighty God, even during these dark days. They'll no sooner get saved 
that they'll be hated, persecuted. They'll be hunted down like dogs by the Antichrist. There'll be many of them, apparently a great many of them, martyred, slain for their faith. We're going to learn soon, very soon, God is going to set apart thousands and thousands of evangelists. That's the best word I'd come up with. Jewish evangelists. They're going to go around preaching the word of God during the tribulation. They're going to be people saved. God's going to send two witnesses miraculously. We're going to study it. And, and uh, there are going to be people saved through their ministry. There is later an angel going to fly through the heavens preaching the everlasting gospel. And, and uh, we've got a lot to study in the book of Revelation. There are going to be people saved. But it, they get saved, they get hated, they get persecuted, and they get slaughtered. And uh, when they get slaughtered, their bodies, of course, remain here on earth, probably beheaded or, or stoned to death or burned alive. But their souls, their souls have gone to heaven. Paul said this. Does anybody believe it? He said it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. When I die, I'll know sooner my soul, my spirit will leave this body and instantly be in the presence of the Lord. They're under, they're, I, I, he opened the fifth cell and I saw under the altar, oh boy, let's stop. there are two altars in the temple. Two altars in the tabernacle. The tabernacle was the temporary building, the temple, a, a more permanent building. So in God's hand, there are two altars. One is the largest piece of furniture in the tabernacle. It's the brass altar. I think it's a symbol of the cross where Jesus died. It's where all the lambs were slain uh, for the uh, covering the atonement of sin. There is a smaller altar in the interior in the holy place in the tabernacle it's called the golden altar of incense these souls are under one of those two altars you say preacher we're not going to settle with that tell us which one i'm not sure i've been praying about it perhaps they're under the brass altar every time a sacrifice was made at that brass altar at that huge altar and the animal is burnt, the blood, the blood of that animal is poured out at the base of the altar. If you'll allow me, poured out under the altar. That might be saying these lives, these precious Christians who've laid down their lives for Jesus' sake, they are sacrifices. They are, they are like that Passover lamb, like that slain lamb, uh, like that little turtle dove, uh, like that little, that, like that big ox, ox and bullock that some uh, farmer sacrificed to Jesus uh, as a picture of the forgiveness of sin. Their blood is under the altar. They died as an act of worship, presenting their bodies a sacrifice to the Lord. Now let's leave the big brass altar with the blood under it. Let's go to the altar of incense. Probably the least preferred opinion among the scholars anyway. The altar of it, it's a golden altar. It is the altar that represents prayer. They would put incense on hot coals uh, on, on the top of the golden altar and that smoke, we've already studied it once that in Revelation, that smoke would have said it's a picture of prayer and these martyred saints, we're going to say it in a minute, they're praying. They're praying to God. They're praying and asking God to do something on them. It could be either altar, but they're in heaven and they're under one of those two altars. When he had opened the fifth seal, John said, I saw it under the altar, the souls of them that were slain for the word of God. Let me give you that verb slain. Sphazo, S-P-H-A-Z-O, Sphazo. What does it mean? Slaughtered. I'll give you a synonym. Butchered. It's got the idea of a brutal killing. 
It's got the idea of a bloodletting, a bloody killing. They have been slaughtered. Why? For the Word of God. For the Word of God. Will anybody say amen here? And it can be a sad amen. The devil hates that book right there. The devil hates the Word of God. These folks love the Bible. They can't quit talking about the Bible. I'm telling you, I believe there are going to be Bibles everywhere during the tribulation in spite of no doubt a concerted effort to, to stamp them out. They'll never get rid of the Word of God. And uh, these they love it. So they can't quit talking about it. They can't quit meditating upon it. They can't quit studying it. And they'll be slain for the Word of God. And, and sometimes that for the Word of God implies that what they say, what comes out of their mouths, uh, their witness. And, and I think the next line explains it. And for the testimony which they held. Let me give you the noun testimony. Martyria. I will spell it. M-A-R-T-U-R-I-A. Martyria. Let me tell you what it means in Greek. Witness. They have been slain and they're dying as a witness to the Lord Jesus. Something like this. He died for me. I learned about it in my Bible. And he's dying for me. If I have to die for his sake, I'm not going to deny his name. I, I'm not going to curse him. I, I will die before I will do. I love my Savior for their testimony. And that, that's quite a test for their testimony, martyria, which they held. And let me tell you, the greatest testimony you can give. I'll get to go into a pulpit, the Lord dwelling Sunday morning near the city of Augusta, Georgia. I'll get to open that book and preach the word of God and, and give a testimony of truth from this book. And that's wonderful. That's what God called me to do. But even a deeper, even probably a more powerful testimony during this time is when they become martyria witnesses for Jesus by becoming the very namesake for martyria, martyrs for Jesus. Say, greatest witness a human being can give for Jesus is dying for him. Laying your life down. Not volunteer. This is not suicide. Brutally, brutally massacred because they love and the Antichrist hates Jesus, hates everything that's godly and holy. He'll hate the word of God. They've been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. You could almost say they were willing to, and probably beheading as I said, they were willing to pour out their lives in order to say, I love him. I love him. I cannot tell you, class, the importance that God attaches to that commodity, to that word, B-L-O-O-D, blood. Blood. I believe this. Will anybody say amen? The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. My, my, my. From the blood of Abel, slain early in the book of Jesus, all the way to the blood of the Lord Jesus, all the way to the blood of this land, God uh, accounts for and God holds dear blood shed for his name's sake. I believe even Abel died for the truth. He died for blood sacrifice. So much so that God says, I'll set you here under my altar. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we better look at verse 10. And they cried with a loud voice. The verb cried there, let me give you that. K-R-A-Z-O, crozo, crozo. It means to, to make a loud, audible noise. It means to lift, this is not silent prayer. It means to lift up your voice, to be clearly heard, almost shouting. And they cried with a, Loud voice. Loud voice. That string, loud voice, occurs 12 times in the book of Revelation. Revelation's not a quiet book. It's a loud book. They cried with a loud voice saying, listen to this, How long, O Lord? 
Oh, I don't know about that preacher. How long, oh Lord? They're asking the Lord when he's going to do something. And they're pushing it. How long, oh Lord, holy and true? By the way, Jesus taught us when we pray, first thing we do is magnify God. Let me give an example. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. Here, O Lord, holy and true. If you're going to get your prayers answered, you might ought to brag on God a little bit. Uplift him, praise him, magnify him. And uh, Jesus taught us in the model prayer, the Lord's prayer to do that. He cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true. We're going to have to look at some more. Holy and true. He is holy in fact, we've already studied it. He is, I'm going to call him the thrice holy God, heaven. Right now, they're saying holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. God the Father's holy. God the Son's holy. God the Holy Spirit's a preacher. What does holy mean? Without sin. Spotless. It means set apart. Separated from everything that would be uh, tainted of iniquity. It means none other like him. Oh, boy. oh Lord, holy and true. Holy and true. One day Jesus said this, see if anybody agree, I am the truth. John 14, 6. I am the truth. One day he said this, John 17, 17. Father, thy word is truth. Thy word is truth. Mm. In Titus 1, 2. We are told God cannot lie. He's truth. Uh, in Hebrews 6, 18, we're told it's impossible for God to lie. Oh, God, holy and true. But notice what they call him. Oh, Lord, holy and true. The word that is used here for Lord is used here and here alone in the entire book of Revelation for the Lord Jesus. Oh, Lord, Holy and true. I'm going to spell that word, Lord. D-E-S-P-O-T-E-S. D-E-S-P-O-T-E-S. -E despotes. Despotes. It is our English word, D-E-S-P-O-T, despot. Brother Bagwell, I thought a despot was a dictator. He is. The word carries this idea, owner. Boss, husband, in charge. Uh, it, it, it carries the idea of one that has supremacy, one that has dominion. Oh, Lord, my despot. Oh, Lord, my boss. They have yielded themselves totally to the Lordship, dominion, and power of the Lord God. Oh, oh Lord, holy and true. How long? Dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on earth? Judge is crino, K-R-I-N-O. Let me give you, let me give you the idea of that may to render a sentence, to pass sentence, to pass you. How long, O oh Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge? Dost thou not judge and avenge? Uh, and uh, ek dakeo, ek dakeo, only used six times in the New Testament to protect, to defend, almost this, to treat right, to treat properly. Oh Lord, how long is it going to be till you judge and avenge our blood? That's innocent blood that's been shed by the Antichrist and his crowd. Lord, when are you going to do something about it? When are you going to avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Now let's look at that expression a bit. Them that dwell on the earth. The Greek has something like this. Earth dwellers. Earth dwellers. And it means this. Those who are at home on this earth. 
Those who are pleased with the way things are going on this earth, the crowd that would love the Antichrist, the crowd that would swear their allegiance to him, the, the crowd eventually, we'll, we'll study it, that will take his mark on their forehead or upon their, the devil's crowd. Are you going to avenge our blood on those God-haters, on them that dwell upon the earth? Lord, how long? How long till you avenge our senseless murders? Wow. You say, preacher, I, I don't think they can pray that prayer. Time out. God does not rebuke that prayer they are praying. Preacher, it sounds a little rough. Lord, how long until you judge and avenge our blood on them? Get even with them. Deal with them, Lord. Get what's coming to them. That's exactly what they're saying. And again, God didn't rebuke them. God didn't say, boys, boys, hold up. Hold up here. Or, or there'll be ladies, no doubt, among the martyrs. Uh, uh, say, uh, God allowed them to pray that prayer. I want to introduce you to something, class. The word is imprecation. I-M-P-R-E-C-A-T-I-O-N. Imprecation. Prayers like this. How long, O Lord, holy and true, till you judge them, till you avenge them, uh, till, you, till you pour out your wrath upon them, those that are dwelled, dwell, earth dwellers, the wicked of this, God haters of this world. Imprecatory prayer is built all the way through the word of God. Let me tell you what they just asked. Lord, when are you going to judge them? How long will you judge them? Lord, would you go ahead and judge them? That's the intent of the prayer. All they're asking is this. See if I can get an amen. I may not get a single amen. Father, thy will be done. How many of you believe Psalm 2? Jesus, God said, God the Father said, I'm going to set my king, Jesus, on the holy hill of Zion. He, he's going to come back with a rod of iron. He's going to judge iniquity. He'll break them in pieces like a potter's vessel that has been shattered against the hard rocks below. God's will. God's will. How many of you believe Jesus is going to judge iniquity? How many of you believe the Antichrist is going to be slain? How many of you believe the devil's going to be cast uh, into a place of eternal torment? Yes, preacher, yes. Yeah. Thy will be done. Well, if God's will is going to be done, God does not rebuke imprecatory prayers. There is a time and there is a place when people are so wicked, people are so rebellious, people have become reprobate. There's a time God allows prayers of imprecation. God deal with them. God don't let them ruin another young generation. God, don't let them to continue to mock your Bible. God, step in and judge this whole wicked world. God, don't let us, uh, don't let this uh, nation, this world continue to murder uh, little innocent babies. And don't let them, don't let them. How long? How long? God's going to answer them. Verse 11. And white robes were given unto every one of them. White robes were given to every one of them. I want you to notice it said to the souls of them that were slain for the word of God. I do not see that they have, I, I'll guarantee you this, they do not have their glorified bodies yet. Tribulation saints, I don't think the tribulation saints get their glorified body to a resurrection that is yet future. They will get a glorified body. Uh, all we got our glorified bodies, church. We got our glorified bodies back in chapter 4, verse 1 at the rapture. Here are souls under that. Well then, preacher, can you explain the white robes? Can you explain the white is purity? No sin, no stain, no blot, no scar. And by the way, that's got nothing to do with color of skin. That's got nothing to do with one track. This is Bible typology, the colors of Scripture, and, uh, and uh, white robes. Let me give you that word for robes. It, it gives us our English word stole, S-T-O-L-E. It's stola. Well, I think I can pronounce it stole, S-T-O-L-E, stole. 
uh, only used four times in Revelation. And I think every time, now there are white raiment passages in Revelation that are dressed in white passages, walking in white passages. But as far as white robes, I think every time it's used, it's applied to martyrs who die for the faith. They are there in spirit bodies, I believe. You say, well, I don't know. Can you see a spirit? Angels are spirits. They're called ministering spirits in Hebrews chapter 1. And you sure could say they saw Gabriel. They saw Michael. Yes, you could see. Jesus said some have entertained angels unaware. You can see. And uh, white robes, righteous. It's a reward for their faithfulness. It's a reward that they did not deny the Lord. They were faithful unto death. Everyone given white robe, and it was said unto them, here comes the Lord's answer, it was said unto them that they should rest for a little season. Rest for a little season. Oh, they've not had rest for the time of the tribulation. They've no doubt had to hide in caves. They've had to worship incognito uh, in, under a little clump of trees or uh, over yonder uh, in the backwoods and worship quietly because if they're caught, they'll be slain. Just rest. Oh, oh my, you're so tired. Rest for a little season. Now this is an astounding answer God gives them. Until your fellow servants, until your Fellow servants, soon dolos. It means fellow slaves until your fellow servants also and their brethren, get this, that should be killed like you were. That should be killed like you were. And that word means to put to death. That they, y'all wait. I'm going to judge iniquity. I'm going to judge their sin. They're going to be held responsible for shedding your innocent blood. But I want you to wait. I want you to pause. Take part in the worship of heaven. Take some time and enjoy and rest. And uh, Because others are going to be slain. Others are going to be martyred. And it looks like it's going to be, we'll, we'll see another a crowd of martyrs. Looks like it's going to be a lot until their fellow servants and their brethren that should be killed Wow, that should be killed as they were. So that should be fulfilled. God knows there's going to be a time of slaughter to his children. Seven, Revelation never says it's seven year tribulation. Revelation talks about three and a half years or 42 months or 1260 days. That's half of the tribulation. We go to Daniel's 70th week. We can't get into that in this class to get the seven year tribulation. But I'm pretty sure the duration is seven years. You got to wait. Others, God knows there are going to be others saved. Others are going to trust in Him. Others are going to believe on Him. And they're going to be martyred. They're going to be slain for the glory of God. They're going to be, they'll be carried up to under the altar and, and their blood uh, will, will be uh, 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 the souls of them that were slain for the word of God under the altar where the blood of the innocent animals are put. Our whole lesson, and I know it's going to take this turn, our whole lesson has been about martyrdom. That's the fifth seal. Revelation does this. It goes earth, heaven, earth, heaven, earth, heaven through the whole 22 chapters. Earth, heaven, chapters 1, earth. Chapters 2 and 3, earth. Chapters 4 and 5, heaven. Chapter 6, verse, uh, seals 1, 2, 3, and 4, back on earth. Seal 5, up in heaven, uh, on, at the altar. And, and these that are gathered around. Let me just give you some statistics. I'm not going to read them. I'm going to hold them there. And uh, you look them over. People giving their lives, not just 2,000 years ago in the days of the Bible, and not just in the future, in the days of the church, right now, right now, laying down their lives for the cause of our Savior. Pouring out their blood, as it were, for the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. When Paul was ready to die, he said, I am now ready to be offered. I am now ready. 
The verb is spindo, to be poured out. They think they're going to kill me, murder me. I'm going to pour out my blood when my head roll and worship my Savior.